please stand as we open in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this wonderful Sunday that you've given us to gather with the believers. Let us glorify you with the words in these songs and with our voices. Amen. First song is going to be number 170, One Day. <clears throat> song we're going to do is 172, Tell Me the Story of Jesus. 
Welcome everybody this morning as we worship the Lord. Uh, so good to see everybody that could make it this morning to, to be here on the Lord's Day. And uh, still enjoying outside a lot. I don't know about you guys are every night. See, we went to Rotary Park and walked the river walk and we, we checked out the tank. Have you guys seen the tank at the memorial down there? Pretty awesome. It's like a M101 A5, which they used in the I think they used it in the Vietnam War and they, they've decommissioned it and they put it on the island where they have the memorials for, um, it's, they have the Arizona Memorial, that's right down from the restaurant and the American Legion and then the next one is like where Lazy Harry's used to be and they have this tank there, it's pretty cool and they've spiffed it up a little bit. So we, uh, we actually rode our bikes down there and then yesterday we went to the Laughlin Park Laughlin Park in Laughlin. You guys have been there. I know you have on the hill where you can see the whole valley. The grass is brown. First time ever. I've been going there for 20 years. So there must be a water conservation or maybe they're going to redo the whole thing. I don't know, but the grass is like brown. It's so green there that I was shocked. But anyway, we've been enjoying the outdoors anyway. And last Saturday we had a great time with our graduates. It was a really good time together. I know most of you were there and uh, we were able to honor our graduates. And also I've been doing some stuff around the church. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but I actually actually fixed the chairs. They were all over the place, like leaning this way and that way. Also, I mean, maybe I already knew this, but I knew, you know, like these doors do not line up with the middle of the thing. You know, this is a little bit off. 
It should be like over here. So that's why if you walk in, the chairs might look a little skewed. But uh, it's okay. It's just the way the doors are. The doors are not in the middle of the entire uh, hall. And I figured that out because I measured it. And I've never done that in the 30 years, 40 years I've been associated with this church. But uh, we've did, I found that out, and then I tried to set them up. We've got dark red here. The lighter red is in the back. You might have noticed, maybe. And I just tried to move some things, gave us a little more room for recording over here. And I'm looking for a media specialist. So uh, if anybody's interested, I'm asking the young people to do it. I feel like they probably are, would be better at that because they're young. But uh, anyway, we'll see how that goes. Let me put this on. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so doing some things. Also, uh, uh, what I did was, and I'll show it right now if I can. Um, I'd like to show an estimate that I did for the parking lot. As you know, the parking lot needs to be redone. So uh, I found a place that would do it for us. And, and I'll show it to you in just a minute. In fact, let me just pass it out, too. I have, the, I have those here somewhere. Where did I put them? There they are. Pass them out to a couple of you anyway. And we don't have to use this one. Might get another estimate possibly, but I found this. I found these guys to be pretty um, helpful in my. And Bob already saw it, so let me. Okay, here we go. Let me just explain some of the things that I've been doing uh, since I've been off. I've been trying to spend some time up here and, and try and figure out things that I think would be helpful for our ministry. And uh, one of those is we had, a, we had phone service with a security system. And that was costing us $80 for the phone service, $40 for the security system. And to be totally honest with you, there are months and months where we were paying for that. We were using neither. Uh, and uh, the phone was out for a while. And I didn't realize it until a couple months after it was done because you just don't use that phone very often. So we've canceled that phone service. Now we have a cell phone. I posted the new phone number. It's a cell phone, and it's right Behind, behind the computer, right? It's right there, right? So um, I'm taking it, I'm keeping it with me during the week, and then it's always here, always have it up here. Uh, if anybody needs to need, use it during the church service, of course, you're, you're um, welcome to that. And so that's, that's there. Also, um, we are gonna, we're gonna set up TWN, phone uh, internet. We're doing the very lowest, uh, the lowest service they have, because we only use it on Sundays. But we'll be able to set up a security system. We're going to use a ring system. And I'm working on that. I have the system. I'm going to call an electrician who helps me with a lot of things around here. And we'll just set it up. It'll be tied to the internet service. That's more of the reason why I wanted to get the internet service. The internet service is $50 only. And the ring system was supposed to be 129 at Lowe's, but ended up the sale was, I missed the sale by one day. So I think we I put $200 on the uh, the security system. By the way, these are all things as pastor I have the right to do in the Constitution. I want to let you know that. If it's above $500, then we need to vote on it. So, in the meantime, I got an in, I got a uh, estimate about the parking lot. I think that price was way lower than I thought it was going to be. So, I'm going to try and get one more, uh, to just get another person to come and make an estimate. I have a feeling there will be more. But, um, I just wanted to let you all know about that. I'll talk to you afterwards about any, any of your uh, concerns about it. If you look at the picture, in fact, I'll bring it up so everybody can see it. The picture of before and after looks like kind of a parking lot like ours, but it'll, uh, a little bit bigger. This guy is from Kingman. And uh, let me bring it up. <clears throat> this guy is from Kingman and... Shoot, I just lost my, there we go. And I got him from Angie's List. I got his name from Angie's List. And there's his license number. This is what he's actually going to be doing. But this is the place that he worked on. And this is what it looked like when he was done. 
And I think it was beautiful. Like, I mean, uh, when we did this before, it kind of looks similar to when we uh, repaved it uh, about 10 years ago. So, um, so anyway, I feel like this is a pretty good deal. He's going to do all the painting. Um, some people were asking if we could maybe extend the, the, the turn in and maybe add a little bit to the paving at the very end. So when you turn in, there's kind of like a, like a, kind of like a half circle there, so there's more room to turn in. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look into that. But if you have any concerns, talk to me after the service, and um, I'll ask him those questions. And he said he's not busy, like he could do it next week, so, which is pretty cool. Um, as far as the money in our uh, account, and you guys can, I'll let you guys take a look at this. We have 12,993 in our savings account, 2,590 in our checking account, which is about 3,000 more than we did last summer. So we, uh, we've saved that much money, and some of you have been giving amazingly, so I praise the Lord for giving to the ministry, because that's what we're trying to do here, is reach people for Jesus. Uh, but I appreciate all of you who have been giving, but I think that gives us that extra to be able to do this. And, uh, we do have some of that money's uh, designated for camp. We have scholarships. It looks like we may only send maybe two or three kids to camp, but um, maybe four, maybe five. But uh, there's not a lot there, so it's gonna for camp. It's somewhere around two thousand that we have kind of designated to help with the scholarship program. So anyway, if anybody has any questions, I'll take those right now since we're talking about it. Does anybody have any questions about this at all? You can talk to me after if you'd rather. Yes, Bob? Uh-huh. Yeah, that's that's yeah, that that's the internet service. The TWN is the one that's associated with MEC. And we've been using it. We've not had one drop in the entire time that we've had it, which we had one every week, the uh, every day, <laughs> that other service we had. So it's a, a big improvement. And and they came out and made an estimate. And so that will be happening, I would say, in the next two weeks. They just put us in line, and as soon as they get to us, then it's, it, they have it out here. So then there's no extra cost at all for any of the, the hookup. It's just the flat. They'll just start charging us $59 a month, and that's it. So, so overall, if you take all of that, having the phone service and the security system that we used to have, we're actually paying about the same, a little bit less, but with this change. And then the ring system is like $5 a month to use. And I'll monitor it on this phone. And I'll have a, so if anybody comes by and they're, they're doing something, I'll see it. Because it, it detects anybody that comes, comes in, in range of the camera. So if anybody, I, I guess they could come in the back, but you know, most likely people would drive up. It'll tell me exactly. And at nighttime, the lights pop on if anybody comes up. So. Anyway, I've already bought that system, so it's ready to go. So I just wanted to let you all know about that. If you have any questions, I'm going to ask some of you guys to give me a yes or no. Uh, there's just a few of you that are actually voting members at this point, so I'll just talk to you individually, and we'll, um, we'll go, uh, go ahead with that. Uh, anyway, so I'll just talk to you guys after that. Any, anyway, so I just wanted to let you guys know about that. Uh, take a look at your bulletin. Let's get back to the rest of today. Let's see if I... Where did my bulletin go? There it is. Yeah, so uh, Wednesday we have our uh, Bible study. You guys are all welcome to join us at Facebook Messaging. Uh, we're still, Mom's still coming in from Oklahoma City. It's pretty cool. And you all are welcome to do that. Rummage sale this week is uh, on Friday and Saturday. If you need any help picking stuff up earlier in the week, please let me know. I could come by your house with, you know, we have two vans, so I could come by with the van empty and put as much as I can in there and bring it up here and drop it off. If you need any help with that, let me know. If it's something really big, I might need some of others of you to help me out if you can. But uh, we're going to uh, set up on Wednesday evening. If you'd like to help out with that, we could use a few hands with that. Hopefully the kids will be there to help out with that. The money that we raise for that goes to Camp Ironwood. And... Uh, uh, so it goes to their um, their scholarship program, and we have we have now uh, waxed I think eight cars so far. So it's pretty good. I told them, hey, so uh, on Thursday we we're doing our second car, or Tuesday uh, we we're doing our last car of the week, 
and I asked um, Dane, I said, Dane, so the next one I can just like watch, I can sit back. He says, no, we need to, we need, we need you for a couple more before we can do it on our own. So uh, Dane and um, Kylie, uh, they're the ones that have been able to come so far. So uh, anyway, if you would like your car detailed, we could still do yours. And, and like I always tell people, I always tell people I'll see cars that, that we have detailed, like my mom's car, which Esther has, no oxidation. The other day I saw the same car, and it was two, maybe three or four years you know, newer than hers, and the whole top was gone. And I, I told one of those kids, I said, hey, see that car right there? And that's one that wasn't waxed in the summertime. And our car is waxed every summer, and the oxidation gets, is at bay, you, know, you can keep, a, keep a control. So if you don't do that already, and you'd like us to help you with that, we'd love to help you as we raise money for camp. So that's car detailing. Camp Ironwood is July 10 through 15. So if you know of people that might want to go to camp, please let us know. You might be able to work it out for them. And our new phone number is 928-219-2068. So if you want to make note of that, you can. You can always get a hold of me at my number, and most of you have my personal phone. That's where you go first. But if for some reason you wanted to add that, you could. So. And it's, uh, it's in the newspaper. I almost didn't want to put it there, but it is in the newspaper. And um, it's on the website now. So both you can, people can get it, access that uh, there. So, okay. Let's see if I can get my introduction to work here. Okay, here we go. Okay. Okay, there we go. I was told I was a little bit too long with it last week. So, all right. It is the apologetics moment, and we're still working on does the Old Testament treat women as lesser human beings? And uh, new, new and old, but we're uh, focusing on the Old Testament. So, last week, we looked at the theological argument, all those verses talking about teachings and how men and women are equal and how they should react to it, how they should respond to it. The historical argument says the Old Testament is full of powerful matriarchs who are highly valued and exerted a great deal of influence. The testimony of the Old Testament uh, authors reveals a perspective that can hardly be called misogynistic. Consider the following list for starters. Sarah. Hagar, Rebecca, Rachel, Leah, Tamar, all in Genesis. The Hebrew midwife, Shipra and Pua. The Egyptian princess, Miriam and Jethro's seven daughters, including Zipporah, Moses' wife. The daughters of Z Zelophehad, Deborah, Ruth, Naomi, Abigail, Bathsheba. And let's not forget that excellent Proverbs 31 woman. These strong women stepped forward and wielded influence with the best of them. And you don't see that in most ancient literature at all. Very little of women having that kind of um, standing. The Bible stands out amongst all books when it comes to this. So if you're with a group, someone says, hey, the Bible, it's misogynistic. It's, you know, it's, um, you know, whatever. You can say that's not true. God's word is, is, stands above all of that. So anyway, I get this, I get this from a book called is God a moral monster, which some people would try and argue and try and uh, pull down God's word as the authority. And this book is really challenging as it looks at some of these issues and challenges our thinking about it. So anyway, I um, wanted to uh, challenge you with that. Let's take our offering. Kevin, if you can grab the... Again, appreciate uh, how we have so many givers in our church and how God has blessed us. I challenge you to continue uh, and give as God has blessed you. I mean, that's all you can do. Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to be a part of the ministry here at Trinity Baptist Church. And I pray, Lord, that you give us wisdom as we think about how we can uh, take uh, these funds that you have uh, challenged our hearts and, and convicted us to give uh, and take use them in a way that glorifies you. Um, like even with this parking lot, Lord, I pray that when we do that, it will glorify, it will lift up your name because it looks better and people will feel more comfortable coming to our church and worshiping the Lord and hearing about the gospel. 
and it, it would show glory to you. That's all. That's what we want to do. We, and help as we give, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm sorry. <laughs> He's like, what do I do with that? All right, here we go. His robes one high, a wonderful exchange. Clothed in my sin, Christ offered me to praise. Forsaken God, estranged from God, but by such love my life is not my own. I praise my all shall be for Christ alone. His rose for my one If you'll turn your Bibles to the book of Romans, please, the book of Romans. We're continuing our discussion of 
really the book about the gospel, the, the gospel of Jesus and his way of giving us eternal life. And Romans really spends much time discussing sin and the satisfaction for sin in Jesus' life. And Paul details and shows us how it all works. Talks about Adam and the uh, sin problem, how we um, inherited the sin problem. We've, we've been reading about that. Uh, and then he talks about how that sin is taken care of through Jesus. And so we've been looking at that last week. Does anybody remember, without like peeking, does anybody remember the message from last week? What the title was? Anyone? It was two contrasting things. It says, how can we be this and this? And they're totally opposites. Anybody remember? Dead and alive. Dead and alive. And he's, yeah. <laughs> Dead and alive, yeah. Dead to sin, alive to God. Yeah, that's it. Awesome. You win the award. Even if you were peaking, I'm okay with that. So uh, anyway, yeah, it's dead, dead to sin, uh, alive to God. And this week, the, if you'll notice, it's who do you serve? Like, who do you serve? As a believer in Jesus, who do you serve? And the answer to that is, is Jesus. We should be serving Christ. We should be serving his ways. We should be, we should be a servant, a slave. And, and, and you know, the, the New Testament wording, especially in the uh, in, in, in the ESV, it usually uses the word, usually it uses the word servant instead of slave, because we have some negative connotations with slave. The King James Version uses slave, a slave to God, a slave in Christ. And it's not a negative thing. Like if we're bound to Christ, a bond servant for Jesus, that's not a negative thing. That's a wonderful thing. That's servant serving with Jesus. And there doesn't have to be that negative connotation. It's nothing like slavery. It's nothing like persecution. It's nothing like getting beat and saying, you better do this or else. That's not the way it is with Jesus. That's not the bond servant of Christ. Don't ever let that happen. Don't ever let yourself kind of be brought into that understanding because that's not what it is. Who do you serve? Do you serve sin or do you serve Jesus? That's what we're going to look at today. So, uh, we're going to start in verse 15. Let's start there of Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 15. It says, What then? Are we to sin because we are no longer, because we are not under the law, but under grace? And what does he say? By no means. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. That's the King James style of it. Shall we be servants under the law. And he says, hey, man, we're, we shouldn't do that because we're under grace. So we, we, have a, we have a better way. Here's another way of saying it now. This is, uh, this is from the, the commentary I was reading from John MacArthur. This is what he said. Are you kidding? Shall we continue sinning when we feel like, to sin when we feel like, because we are not having to work for our salvation? And instead of being blessed by God's saving grace, no way. This is a ridiculous thought. It's a better way of saying that verse. Again, remember we talked about Rasputin last week. Remember Rasputin? He's the guy who said, hey, sin as much as you want because then the grace is greater. You know? Sometimes we might get that feeling. You look at people and sometimes you feel that way. You know, I've run into a couple like drug addicts that were transformed by Jesus Christ. And their lives are totally different now. You probably run into some people like that, or their lives are uh, are terrible, you know, like um, just awful lifestyle. In, and and God transformed them. And you kind of look at them and go, "Wow, somehow is the grace greater for them?" No, it's not. That's not true. No, grace is is good for all of us. Let's. You, know, you might hear stories like this. Well, man, well, then I want to go out and sin really bad, and then the grace will be greater for me. Paul says, no, you can't be thinking like that. You know, they were surrounded by these very religious Pharisees who were bound to all these rules and regulations, and 
Those are the kind of things that they felt were getting them to heaven. Paul goes, that's not the gospel, man. The gospel is about grace. But the grace that happens in our heart should transform our heart and should make us want to serve Christ and want to do the law, man. So, God forbid, of course not, should we be having that attitude. Believer does not habitually sin. This is something that all of us need to understand. This is from 1 John 3, 9 and 10. No one who was born of God practices sin. Now, uh, but we'll keep going, sin. Because he, his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. If you go to 1 John chapter 3, verses 9, if you go to 1 John, that's what the whole book is about. Like you read it, it says, if you sin, you're going to die. It says, if you don't love, then you're not of God. That's the kind of stuff that's in there. <coughs> so I, I warn you, if you go through the book of 1 John, you like want to tackle that book? If you decide to go tackle 1 John, be careful. okay? Because when it says, those who sin will die. Those who sin aren't of God. You must understand what he's talking about is people that are, are habitually sinning. They're constantly turning their back on God. They're living, you know, kind of like Rasputin way, just living to do whatever they want to do. They don't even regard God when they make decisions about life or decisions about morality. They're just living however they feel. Right? That's the person that 1 John is talking about, the habitual sinner. And, and, and as we look at this, you go, wow, you know, like I, I read through 1 John and I'm feeling like I'm not saved all of a sudden because I'm a sinner. And things slip. And sometimes I, I, I have these, these uh, drift-offs, you might say. And that's not what I'm talking about. The habitual sinner doesn't care. He sins. He does what he wants. He, he does his own thing. He doesn't, doesn't regard. He gets mad. He gets angry. He doesn't care. He, he's not like a person who gets angry. You know, most people, you know, that have anger issues and they're believers. You know, they might get to that point where they get angry and they yell at somebody and they sin. But, look, but if, if, if they're walking with Jesus, man, right away they like grab a hold of that and say, man, oh, shoot, man, I'm sorry. Like, like right, around, right away or, or soon after, they realize it. Or maybe a couple days later, man, they go, man, that was wrong. And they have this attitude of grace in their life. And it's not continual. It doesn't just continue. It doesn't become bitter. It doesn't just continue and continue. Right? That's the believer. That's walking with Jesus there. Right? Uh, so be careful with that. And that's what we're talking about. We don't want to serve sin. Sin's going to happen. But we can't be servants of sin. That's what he's talking about here. So a couple points I want to make about either serving sin or serving Jesus. By the way, as I was going through this, I was doing some work on the website. I saw Alex as the preacher, clicked it on. Now, I was already ready for this day. Prepared my message. It was yesterday. And I turned it on, and it was Alex's message. Guess what he was preaching on? It was Romans chapter 6, verse 15 through 23. So I was like, maybe I should listen to him as a resource, which I, I didn't. I listened to a little bit. But if you remember something from when he preached, I think it was back in October. But it was the same passage. He probably has a different take on it. But um, it's kind of cool, though, just going through. And I pop it on, and there was Alex preaching on this passage. It was really kind of funny. But um, so number one, first thing I want to point out in this idea of being servant to sin or, servants or a servant to God is obedience or sin. So we are going to make a choice here in verse 16. So let's look at verse 16 of chapter 6. Look what it says in verse 16. And I need to get a large print version. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? Now, we want to be slaves to obedience because we have a love relationship with God. Like, we should be slaves of obedience. What does God want me to do? Like, 
There's no faith, saving faith in God apart from obedience to God. And there can be no godly obedience without godly faith. As a beautiful and popular hymn admonishes, remember that song? Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And again, it's not perfection. But if you're a true believer, faith in Christ means obedience, that you should be known for obedience. doesn't mean you're perfect, but it means you're known for obedience to God. That's what he's talking about here, obedience or sin. Second point I want to make in verse 17, so keep reading there, it says, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. Paul says, be thankful, because you were once slave to sin, and that was a bad life. But you've become obedient from the heart. And what have you, your heart has come into what? The standard of teaching to which you're committed. What is teaching? Another word for teaching in the Bible is doctrine. And you might say, doctrine, that's kind of a far off word. It's a very academic word. Don't mess with doctrine. But I'm going to tell you, you should. That's what apologetics is all about, by the way. And that's why I've been bringing that up. The teaching about women in the Bible. What is that like? Is it to push women down? Is it to, to make women subservient? Is it to shut them out from all decision making? No! That is not the teaching from the Bible, even though some would say that. Does it say a man is the head of the home? Yeah, there's that. Well, how do you, how do you deal with that? It's a teaching from the scripture. And there's some teaching from the scripture that I can explain really well. Uh, and I can explain that. Because you know how? Because I know about salvation. And God wanted the family to look, look like a picture of the gospel. Just as Jesus loves the church like his own soul. Just as Jesus loved the church and the gospel plan is pictured. That's pictured in the, in the marriage between a man and a woman together. And the picture is Jesus, Jesus is the man and the church is the woman. That's the way the picture is. Right? And so that is the role of a man and a woman in a marriage, right? And again, it's not all these other things that the world likes. Oh, wow, that's, that's sex. This is all get out. No, it isn't. Some people take it that way. There's all these people and believers in history that some, sometimes went to the extreme and didn't really understand the teaching like they should have. And, instead of the beautiful picture of the gospel. And the stuff we see today is destroying that and that's what makes it so sad and horrible like for us as believers we're watching some of the stuff that's going on with teaching about the family we should really care about doctrine though if we're serving Christ instead of sin doctrine matters J.B. Phillips rendering of Romans 12 1 if you want to look over there but I'm just going to read it for you look what he says don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold but let God remold your minds from within. This is what happens to young believers in, in, in my life, in my world, in parts of my world. People have been surrounding themselves with bad doctrinal teachings. They know the truth. But on the surface, they may, may not understand it, may never really studied it. And so they hear all these other people saying, you know what? God's view of marriage, it's, I don't want to agree with that. I'm going to add something to it. I'm going to change it. I'm going to come up with a whole other teaching about what the families should be like. That has nothing to do with the Bible. And they're around people, they're hearing that, and they're going, you know what? The world, like he says here, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. And before you know it, they're saying, oh, I'm done with that teaching from the Bible. I'm going to do with the one I think feels good to me. That's serving sin. Yeah. You say, well, no, it's not really sinful what they're saying. It doesn't seem like it's sinful. It's just a different teaching. It's a different, just, can't everybody just have their own teaching? No, they can't. Let God remold your minds from within. Wow, that's really cool. 
A person cannot invent his own way to God, no matter how sincere his efforts might be. God has established the only way to come to him, and that is the way of faith in his son, Jesus Christ. And saving faith in Jesus Christ is built on God's revelations about him, not on men's ideas about him. This is also from John MacArthur. I'm just going to tell you, he is kind of my main source as I put this, uh, put this message together. But some really wise words there. Saving faith in Jesus Christ is built on God's revelation about him and not on man's ideas. It can't be on man's ideas. What is the doctrine that really matters? Okay, and we've talked about this, but what are the, what are the essentials? What are the fundamental teachings of the Bible that we can't give up? We have to fight for. And you might even say, you got to believe these. And I don't, know, I, I don't know if I could fully go to this point, but you need to believe these to really understand the gospel well. If you don't, know, if you don't really believe Jesus is God, the gospel, the gospel about what he did on the cross and all of that, it doesn't really mean anything. If he's not God, the saving power isn't there. So if someone says, well, I believe everything about the gospel, but I don't believe Jesus is God. I just think he was a man. You might go, well, no, God, God's the only one who can and save. He's the only one who can do the miracles. He's the only one who can come back to, from the dead. A man can't do those things, right? So you got to be careful about those things and make sure you have these down. This is what we used to say at the beginning of, of chapel when I went to college. What does it say? I believe in the inspiration of the Bible both the Old and New Testaments, the creation of man by the direct act of God, the incarnation and virgin birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, his identification as the Son of God, his vicarious, vicarious means taking our place, taking the place of us, atonement, for the sins of mankind by the shedding of his blood on the cross, the resurrection of his body from the tomb, his power to save men from sin, the new birth through regeneration by the Holy Spirit, and the gift of eternal life by the grace of God. Now those things are really solid, very fundamental. There was a time in our history, American history of Christianity, where people were questioning many of these things. And there was a big fight, and you heard, you know, you hear that word fundamentalist? It's kind of a negative term in American Christianity today. But back in 1920, it was huge, because this was all of the things that they were fighting over. They weren't talking about same-sex marriage. They weren't talking about all these things that we're dealing with today, which I think in many ways are almost as important. It was so much simpler, though. I, I don't know. They probably didn't think it was simple. Like, I don't think today is simple. But the, this is the doctrines that, that are important. Anything else that really matters? You might want to go to the Ten Commandments. Most of our society believes in most of the Ten Commandments. And there are some of the Ten Commandments, like the Sabbath teaching, that in today's, um, in today's walk with Christ, it is looked at differently because we are not the children of Israel, so we look at things a little bit differently. Ten, Ten Commandments, there's a couple of those. Uh, which ones are being destroyed? Life, sanctity of life, sexual purity, and the family have been destroyed in today's world. I'm going to give you some other things that I think are really important as essentials. We'll get to that later, but anyway. Freedom. Or slavery. Verse 18. Let's continue on in the scripture. Back to Romans 6. Look what it says. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. That's where we need to be. Not slavery to sin, but we, need, we are free from that slavery. Is it really free to live a life of unbridled, unbridled morals? Would I be freer if I had been given the choice to do what I wanted? I don't think so. That's for me. I'll do what I want. No, I'll do what God wants. Are we free to do what God wants and not what we want? Live free in Christ and you will truly be free. So number three, freedom or slavery. Number four, being yielded to God. Holiness or uncleanness. Look at verses 19 and 20 of chapter 6. I am speaking in human terms because your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lewdness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. Many of these Roman, it's Rome, right? It's out of control. People are living, many of the believers that came to Jesus had lived really bad lives. Some of them 
their immorality was part of their religion as well. You know, the Baal worship, the, some of the Roman practices. You know, the, I teach this to my students a little bit when we talk about the civic virtue. And I, I tell, you know, there's civic virtue versus natural rights, and the kind of the battle between living for the community, community or fighting for your individual rights. But when I talk about civic virtue, someone might say, hey, what about some of those Roman Romans? Like, they talked about the community. They would give up their lives for the community. People would die, give up their very life for the community. But in their personal life, they lived however they wanted. They were immoral. They had many women or many men in their lives. Sexually, they were not pure at all. They were living out of control. And that's more of what he's saying here. These believers in Rome had lived these immoral lives and they came to Jesus and he says, hey, now you need to yield your members, your body to Jesus and live in a moral way and consistent with God's word. If you're not yielded to God, then you are a slave to sin. You have to be yielded to God. Good fruit or no fruit, Galatians 5.22. Let's look at verse 21 first. Look at what verse 21 says. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you now, which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. He's talking about fruit here. He says, you were living this life and it was bringing this bad fruit. Your families were screwed up. You had terrible relationships with your family members because you were immoral. Your children couldn't trust you because you are having affairs. This is the way many of these Romans were living. So if you're going to live holy and, and devoted to God, you are going to be faithful and you're going to show that. And the fruits of the, of the, fruits of the flesh are envy, strife, hatred, overbearing ambition, sadness, tragedy, and hardness. And the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, joy. And that's what happens when we yield ourselves to God. Gift or no gift. Look at verses 22 through 23. But now that you have been set free from sin, have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and it's in eternal life. And then he goes on to say, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Eternal life with Christ. Verses 22 through 23. Don't fall short. Yield your members Yield yourself to God. Don't be a slave to sin. And that's the gift of all of this. It's a beautiful gift. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the wonderful gift. It's eternal life with God forever. And again, I've talked about this before. One thing that you can say as a believer, the way you walk should be like you should walk with a little spring in your step just because you're on your way to heaven I know people right now that need Jesus man and they constantly have this depression that enfolds them they can have good times they can be happy at times but they don't walk with that step of eternal life in the future it does affect you. Really does. And I'm so sad. And I'll, I'll tell people, you need to put your trust in Jesus, man. You need to trust Christ. There's an, a gift. There's a walk. There's a way that's just lighter. It's just lighter walking down the road. Tough, tough times come, you get lifted up. When the difficulties are there, you can fight them and you can win knowing that there's eternal life with Christ in heaven forever. And it's beautiful. It's wonderful. That's my challenge for you as we look at these, these, um, this passage. Slave to God, that's what we need to be, not a slave to sin. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your word. It challenges us and, and, and um, lifts us up and gives us confidence and it gives us this walk this beautiful walk in Christ so thankful for that uh, Lord I pray for the ones maybe there's people here that we know that don't know Jesus I pray for those folks 
that this summer we'd see folks come to Jesus to get saved, to give their life to Jesus. And they can walk, they can walk with us in this like beautiful uh, path with Christ. It doesn't mean we don't have any cares. It doesn't mean our life is perfect. It doesn't mean we're always happy. But there's a joyfulness. There is a hope. And there is a way that uh, just transforms us and helps us. And, and Heavenly Father, there's people we know that need Jesus. Pray that we would we challenge folks to be saved, give their lives to Christ, and, and serve Christ with their life. For we were challenged today, Lord. Don't be these kind of Christians that say, I can do whatever I want, and I'm okay. God forbid that we would live that way. Help us, Lord. Help us to live for you. Take your path, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.